Hi, and welcome to The Web We Left Behind. I'm Kyle, and I'm going to talk about how the past can give us some valuable lessons about how to build usable, resilient web applications, and why the future of JavaScript should involve less JavaScript. Currently, I work as a UI developer for Noyo Technologies, but I've been building things for the web since 2000. I've run my own consultancy, led UI architecture, and managed development teams. And after all that, I'm tired. Not just tired of 2020, but tired of my work. I'm not tired of building products for the web, per se. I'm tired of being a modern JavaScript developer. I'm tired of state management and higher order components and React hooks. I'm tired of six-month TypeScript rewrites. And I mean no offense to the lovely folks at Pika who put this conference together, but I'm tired of build tools too. Tired of Webpack configurations and Babel presets and tree shaking and source maps. This fatigue isn't just about tools. It's part of something larger that I'm feeling, which is that most days I don't seem to be very good at my job. And I don't think this is imposter syndrome, uh, though I have those days too. Mostly, I do feel like I'm in command of the tools of my trade, and I'm decent at the architecture part too. The thing that I've been feeling for a while is that my colleagues and I are making web apps that aren't very good for our users. Setting aside the software industry's shaky ethical record, which deserves a talk of its own, what I mean is that a lot of the apps I've made have been slow, inaccessible, and unreliable. They've been CPU and memory intensive, and plenty of times they've just been broken, and this hasn't gotten consistently better over time. And by most standards, I get paid well to do my work, as do most of you. So I'd like to know that I'm generally building useful things. By which I mean apps that don't exclude certain users because they're different from me, that don't take their users' time for granted, apps that work always, not just sometimes, apps that don't punish basic human errors, and that do what they say on the box. So when I started building websites, I didn't have half the tools I have today. It was basically Notepad++, an FTP client, IE, and Netscape. Now I can write code that's linted and type-checked on the fly, compiled and bundled automatically, and then sent to my browser where I can set conditional breakpoints, tweak styles in real time, and profile memory usage. Yet some days, just visiting my bank's website is enough to make my CPU churn. So what I'm saying is that as front-end developers, we may be working harder than we realize. As we've started doing more with JavaScript, we had to add a module system and module bundlers. We started doing routing on the client side, which means we need to handle loading and intermediate steps. Now we're getting all our data as JSON, and we need to keep it somewhere, so we've built state management frameworks. This gets pretty tricky, so we've added immutability and advanced type systems. And this doesn't leave a lot of time for CSS, so we've added prefab grid systems and component libraries. JavaScript is really growing up, but as parents know, keeping up with a growing child can be exhausting. And a lot of the problems I mentioned on the last slide are pretty hard, so we've outsourced the work to open source libraries. And it's nice not to have to do this work ourselves, but it all adds up. To demonstrate this, I started a new NPM project and installed React and a few related dependencies, plus Babel and Webpack as build tools. At this point, I hadn't written a line of code myself, but I already had 531 packages in my node modules directory. That's a hell of a starting point. And don't get me wrong, dependencies aren't inherently bad. I mean, I'm not trying to rewrite Babel, personally. <laughs> And just because your single page app has to do a lot of work, doesn't mean you should, right? There's a point there, um, but if you have a database, you have a server, and you probably have an API. And that API server has to do routing, and it's got to handle form submissions, and it's got to store data or state across multiple page views and users. So your front end code may be doing unnecessary work. And I think we're climbing a mountain of technical complexity, 
and we don't quite realize it. Sure, we get excited when a new tool emerges, and it simplifies work that was previously difficult. It feels like progress. For instance, I've had a lot of back-end developers tell me that the advent of React was the first time they felt they understood front-end development. And a lot of front-end devs can't imagine going back to the time before TypeScript. But I think we're being a bit myopic. We keep engineering more complexity, and then using complex solutions to abstract it away for a while, until we build new complexity on top of the new abstractions. If we zoom out enough, the overall picture looks less like continual simplification. It's like hiking. When you've been trudging uphill for hours, brief downhill stretches feel pretty good until you start going up again. And, and I think that's been the story of the last 10 years in front-end development. So when I said earlier that I'm tired of being a front-end developer, what I actually meant was something more like this. I'm tired of making JavaScript-heavy, client-rendered, single-page apps. And I think my fatigue is exacerbated by the fact that I remember a time before single-page apps. But like, I don't know, not everyone has been doing this for 20 years. And so if you learned web development within the last 10 years, there's a good chance you've only ever built single-page apps. So I went looking for data on this. Um, there's no great data on front-end devs specifically, but the overall trend is definitely a lot of new developers in recent years. Since React was released, there have been hundreds of thousands of new software developers in the US alone. And since jQuery was released, the numbers have basically doubled. So it's a fair bet that a lot of my audience for this talk has never worked on a product without a front-end framework, a module bundler, and NPM packages. So, like I said, I'm concerned about the quality of the products we're building. But even if you don't share my concern, I, I'm hoping you're convinced that things have gotten pretty complex and that we're working hard to build these rich JavaScript heavy apps. And look, I may be viewing the past with rose colored glasses, but I remember something simpler. Before Ajax and DHTML, every website was server rendered. It wasn't called SSR, it was just a website. And my thesis for this talk is that it's easier to make accessible, reliable, and fast web applications by taking advantage of browsers' built-in features. And to do that, we have to let the server do the heavy lifting. So bear with me. Since a lot of my audience may have only started doing web development in the last several years, I'm going to review a bit of history, and then I can get into my view for the future, where client-side JavaScript takes a load off and, and web servers get back to work generating HTML. So let's talk about the web in general. If the internet is a set of computers connected to each other, the web is a subset of the internet, where many of those computers are servers, and these servers use HTTP to share documents, which are meant to be viewed in web browsers, or clients. URLs tell the browser where to find a given server and what document to request from that server. I know, mind-blowing stuff, right? And just to be clear, there's always a server. Whether it's old-school brochureware, a static site, Jamstack, or even serverless, when you visit a website or open a web app, you are communicating with a computer somewhere else on the web. So for this talk, the question is more about the role a web server should play in constructing UIs specifically. And no matter how you build websites and web applications, the lingua franca of the web is HTML. No matter what, when you're viewing a web app, you're viewing an HTML document. Even if it started life looking like this. HTML is still the basis of the web, and it's powered by links and forms. As you know, there are only two HTML tags, divs and spans. Actually, contrary to that myth, the HTML5 spec includes well over 100 tags. So these tags, like headings and paragraphs and lists, give important structure to the document, which helps out search engines and helps browsers apply useful default styles. But even so, most of these hundred-some tags are pretty much inert. They just describe content. But links and forms are the two cases where HTML goes from being merely a descriptive language to actually specifying functionality. 
The original design of the web is based on the idea of a network of linked documents. But it would be hard to call a web-based game or a video chat a document. Still, a lot of what we do on the web involves following links from one place to another. A news article, a Twitter profile, and the results of your latest continuous integration run are all in some sense documents. And they could all be linked together. But links alone would make for a static web. The thing that enables the web to be more than brochureware is forms. Forms enable you to send emails, buy stocks, and order books. It's the difference between ordering off a menu and asking the bartender to make something special based on your tastes. In other words, forms allow you to communicate information to the server about yourself and about what you want. And forms are what allowed multiple business empires to be built on the back of user-generated content. Businesses like Facebook, YouTube, Craigslist, and Yelp. Forms are built into the architecture of the web, and web browsers know exactly what to do with them. So though the markup we write is fairly simple, browsers do a lot under the hood to make links and forms work. They resolve IP addresses, gather and validate data, parse headers, manage HTTP requests, update the URL bar, and, of course, render documents. But we don't have to take advantage of this. These days, we insist on doing much of this ourselves with JavaScript. Okay, so DHTML is kind of a lost term, but it has a lot to do with why JavaScript exploded in the first place. JS was designed to be run in web browsers, but it's fundamentally just a language. Event handlers, DOM manipulation, and AJAX are all extensions to the core language, and they enable JavaScript to actually interact with the contents of a web page and with the browser in general. Dynamic HTML is when you manipulate the contents of a web page after its initial load, and this is what really makes JavaScript powerful as a web development language. Compared to loading an entire HTML document from a server, DHTML felt instant, and this led to a profound shift in how the web was built. Mozilla may have ushered in this shift when it published a blog post in support of a new inner browsing paradigm in 2003. The other major breakthrough that enabled the client rendered, re rendered web was AJAX. AJAX meant we could fetch arbitrary data from a server without reloading the page. And that meant we could show loading indicators and provide near instant form validation. But this came with a downside. The browser needs instructions from us about what to do with data fetched asynchronously. This may be hard to fully appreciate. Web browsers know to render a whole page when they get an HTML document in response to a synchronous request. It happens automatically. But when a browser makes an asynchronous request via AJAX or fetch, it defers to JavaScript to actually handle that response. And just a quick note before I move on. You'll hear me talk about client rendering and server rendering. In reality, what's properly called rendering always happens in the browser. But for the purpose of this presentation, I'll be using rendering in the common sense, meaning the construction of new HTML. OK, so with the basics covered, let's do some archaeology. So, there's this term, living fossil, which, which comes from Darwin. Basically, it refers to a modern organism that seems to have a lot in common with its distant ancestors. Scientists today are pretty skeptical about living fossils, but the idea is that these organisms give us valuable insight into how the world looked a long-ass time ago. And I started doing this a long-ass time ago so I can help you find some clues about how web developers did things way back then. Wikipedia hasn't changed much since it was launched in 2001, but that hasn't seemed to hold it back. According to Alexa, Wikipedia is the 14th most visited site in the world. In the US, it's number 8. It served 22 billion page views last month alone. In other words, it's working just fine, but it's not what we'd normally consider a modern web app. This image shows the Wikipedia homepage as it looked in December 2001. Here it is a year later, and here it is today. It hasn't changed all that much. So, I'm going to lead you on a little tour of Wikipedia in order to show you some of my favorite features. The rub here is that none of these things is really a feature of Wikipedia. 
They're all built-in features of web browsers, and all Wikipedia has to do to take advantage of them is to send some HTML documents. The first point I want to make is that Wikipedia is resilient. This is a hard thing to demonstrate, because unlike a lot of single-page apps, it doesn't really break. One thing I can show you is what happens when I try to access a page that doesn't exist. Just like an API server, the web server in this case has to let the client know that it couldn't find the requested resource. But Wikipedia doesn't have to execute any special code in the browser to handle this error, because it's a plain old HTML document. In this case, Wikipedia even gives me a suggestion about the correct URL format, which is a bit trickier to do in JSON. And there we go. Another way to demonstrate Wikipedia's resilience is to show what happens when we take away JavaScript. But first, this is what Wikipedia's search looks like for most users, with JavaScript enabled. It's pretty nice, and almost certainly enhanced by the use of JS. I like seeing a list of search results as I type, with matching characters bolded. And if I click on any of the results in this dropdown, I'll get taken directly to the relevant page. But it works pretty well without JavaScript, too. It's not quite as helpful, but if I press enter, I'm taken to a perfectly useful search results page. The basic HTML forms are built to work without JavaScript, something that's exceedingly rare among single-page apps. To make my point about Wikipedia's resilience even clearer, I'll not only disable JavaScript, but CSS as, as well. This isn't beautiful, by any stretch of the imagination, but it does have some clear structure. It's pretty navigable. In general, Wikipedia is accessible. I don't want to overstate this. It's far from perfect in this regard, but it's better than most single-page apps. The folks who build Wikipedia put conscious effort into making sure it's usable by everyone, but much of the reason it's accessible is that it's built from links and forms and semantic HTML, not dialogues and tooltips. When your HTML is solid and built to work without JavaScript, these things are just easier. A further aspect of Wikipedia's accessibility is that it's keyboard navigable. I can operate a mouse without any difficulty, but I still prefer navigating the web by keyboard. I can scroll to the top and the bottom of the page with the home and end keys or arrow keys on a Mac. I can operate forms with my keyboard. In Firefox, I can quickly search. I can quickly navigate by using the apostrophe key to search through links. And I can use a keyboard shortcut to open a link in a new tab. And then I can use the delete or backspace key to go back. And I'm still not done talking about links. When a web application is built as a set of documents connected by links, it enables a whole system of wayfinding provided by web browsers. To start with, there's the page URL itself. I know there's been some debate recently with the Chrome team announcing that they're experimenting with hiding page URLs, but URLs can be useful. Take this one. The URL suggests that the technology portal is one of many, and this provides a quick way to explore. If I've been paying attention to the URL bar, I also know by now that all of the actual encyclopedia content in Wikipedia is namespaced within this wiki directory. So I can try out random topics to see if there's an article and bypass search altogether. I can even change language using the URL bar. In other words, Wikipedia's URLs tell me something about where I am and where I might go. This latter point is also clear when I hover a link. When I hover the link connected to the word largest, I can see a tooltip informing me that I'll be visiting a page with the title 
list of solar system objects by size, and that the URL of the page I'm considering visiting is visible in the bottom left corner of my window. Finally, these links communicate information to, be, to me about where I've already been. See how the link to Jupiter is darkened here to show I've already visited this page. Wikipedia is also memorable, by which I mean it cooperates with the browser's built-in mechanisms for keeping track of what you've seen before. Watch what happens when you scroll down the page a bit and click on an interesting link. When you hit back in your browser, you'll go back to the same spot. Quickly! By contrast, the back button will only work in a single page app if you implement push date, and you can only get back to your scroll position if you constantly keep track of it. Even then, it may be jumpy. And you'll either have to fetch your data again when you hit back, or implement your own caching or memoization. Finally, Wikipedia is actually pretty fast. There are a lot of ways to measure performance, but as a baseline, Lighthouse gives it a 91. So let's dive into that. There are two things keeping it from a perfect score, time to interactive and first CPU idle. And I think this time to interactive thing is a bit misleading. It's true that large chunks of synchronous JavaScript can block the browser from reacting to a link click, even when that link isn't handled by JavaScript. But it's just not true that it takes four plus seconds before you can interact with the Wikipedia page. To prove this, in a quick and dirty way, I disabled the cache, then did a hard refresh of a page with the network tab open in developer tools. As quickly as I could, I clicked the first link I saw to another page. This click was handled 1.62 seconds into the page load and was not queued behind other tasks. So what gives Lighthouse? Well, part of the official definition of time to interactive is event handlers are registered for most visible page elements. It's like it doesn't consider the possibility of a page that works without JavaScript. See, we view everything these days through the lens of single page app architectures, and it can be misleading. Wikipedia is pretty unsexy, but clearly that hasn't stopped it from being immensely useful to hundreds of millions of people. So I'm hoping you'll rethink more than just your technology choices, but your idea of usability as well. It's certainly more difficult to build web apps the way I'm advocating if you want to fill them with modal dialogues and lots of drag and drop. I chose Wikipedia for this talk because its simplicity makes it much easier to see all the things web browsers do for us. We should still ask them to do more for us, like fully support the dialog tag or ship a decent native date picker, but we shouldn't spend so much energy reproducing built-in browser functionality. Uh, remember the complexity mountain from earlier? I think a perfect example of climbing this complexity mountain is the recent fashion for SSR, using frameworks like Next, Nuxt, and Gatsby. This approach supposedly helps with performance and SEO. But it's all kind of circular. Rendering web apps on the server felt slow, so we made client-rendered apps. But that was slow, so we took our client rendering frameworks and adapted them to the server. To me, lackluster performance and poor SEO are symptoms of the complexity of single page apps, and it's foolish to treat these symptoms by tacking on even more frameworks. I also want to take a moment to make it clear that I'm not saying anything truly new here. It's cool to see the recent hype over the email app Hey and its HTML first architecture, and yeah, I saw the second guessing the modern web article going around a few months ago. But people have been advocating for server-first web app architectures for the entirety of the JavaScript era. We've had the term progressive enhancement since at least 2003, and Jeremy Keith coined the term hijacks way back in 2006. Restraint has long had its advocates like Jake Archibald, Leah Veru, and Christian Halman. We've known there was a better way, we just haven't listened. And to close, I want to note that what I'm advocating isn't all or nothing. If you find that the experience of loading a new HTML document from the server feels clunky, there are some options to mitigate this. One is the hijacks approach. Build your pages as pure HTML with working links and forms, and then intercept the requests. You can send back HTML partials and insert them via DHTML. Another, proposed by Philip Walton, is similar to hijacks, but uses a service worker for caching HTML partials and hijacking requests. 
There's also the new Portals Candidate spec, which lets you preload a document and control the behavior of transitioning to it. Finally, you may not have known this, but you don't have to send an HTML document all at once. You can actually send it in chunks and get something kind of like infinite scrolling without all the finicky JS. And really, I'm not a total zealot. I believe client-side JavaScript has a place on the modern web. For real-time monitoring or streaming media or a chat app, client-side rendering is a sensible choice. And I admit that nothing I highlighted about Wikipedia is impossible to achieve with a single page app. It's just really hard, and few apps get it right. We should stick to using JavaScript for cases where the browser doesn't provide a built-in alternative. So let's use links to navigate within an application and forms to send data to the server. And if we do this, generating our HTML client side may seem like overkill. Thanks.